Take a look at the world around us, and it seems easy to separate the living from the dead. Life is present in flocks of birds and in the canopies of rainforests, and is absent in rocks and cold hard computers. But if we try and define exactly what life is, we quickly run into problems. In fact, an answer to the question, what is life, has remained elusive for over two and a half thousand years. That hasn't stopped us looking for it though. In 1976, NASA's Viking probes landed on the surface of Mars in search of Martian life. If all goes as planned, the first Viking lander will separate from the orbiting command ship and descend to the Martian surface. Against all odds, some still argue today that they might have just found it. How? Well, the experiment was actually quite simple. Scoop up some Martian soil, pour some liquid food onto it, and see if anything interesting happens. If there was life in the soil, then the scientists would expect it to digest the food and produce carbon dioxide as a waste product. Every life form on Earth produces carbon dioxide as a part of their metabolism, so it was assumed that Martian life would do the same. To make sure that any carbon dioxide detected did indeed come from the food and not any other source, the NASA scientists used a radioactive form of carbon in the food. If that same radioactive carbon was seen as a gas, then it would have to have come from Martian microbes digesting the food and not any other source. And sure enough, soon after the addition of food to the soil sample, the concentration of radioactive carbon dioxide began to increase. The team were thrilled, they'd found life on Mars. To double check, they heated the sample up to 160 degrees for three hours to presumably kill any microbes, and then added the food again. And well, just as expected, nothing happened. There was no increase in carbon dioxide since the microbes were seemingly all dead. This only seemed to further indicate the existence of life on Mars. But just before they ran to the press to announce their discovery, they did one more experiment. Now, it might seem a little bit pedantic to keep checking and double checking, but in the words of Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So they did one more experiment. They started off again with some fresh Martian soil, poured the food onto it, and got the same initial increase in carbon dioxide. But now they waited for an additional week before adding in a second injection of food. The scientists hypothesized that the microbes would have run out of food after a week, and when given a top up, they would start producing radioactive gas again. This is what happened when they did the same experiment on Earth with normal soil. An initial increase in radioactive carbon dioxide from the first feeding, and a second increase when food was again added a week later. But on Mars, something very strange happened. Instead of increasing with the second lot of food, the concentration of radioactive carbon dioxide began to decrease. Apparently, the CO2 was now being absorbed by the soil, something that was difficult to explain biologically, or even in terms of non-living chemistry. And this was no outlier, since each time more food was added, a decrease in radioactivity was seen. On top of that, a separate instrument on the landers failed to detect any organic molecules in the soil. This meant that the conclusions of the whole expedition were therefore ambiguous. The principal investigators, Gilbert Levin and Patricia Strat, still claim today that we really did find life on Mars. But NASA's official position concluded otherwise, and argued that the results must have just been due to some weird chemistry. Perchlorate in the soil remains the best suggestion. So what went wrong here? Well, clearly the question of life on Mars is still an open one. But some have critiqued the mission even more strongly, and argued that it was actually a philosophical error. Pretty strange critique for a space mission. But philosophers have actually become really intrigued by this NASA mission from the 70s. And to see why, we'll have to dig in and first ask, well, what was NASA actually looking for? For one, it's clear that the experiments were designed to look for microscopic life. Carl Sagan was actually worried that this was too narrow and we might miss the Martian animals hopping around on the surface if we just look at the dirt. He even suggested adding a torch to the rover to see if any Martian moths might be attracted to it. That idea, um, didn't make the cut. And let me say, by the way, that we're looking primarily for microorganisms. Uh, it would be rather fruitless of us for, to look for horses on Mars. So focusing in on microscopic life, the team assumed that Martian biology would be based on carbon chemistry. This seems like a more realistic yardstick than looking for rabbits or horses, but it still has some pretty big problems. Like, why should we restrict life down to a single element? It's entirely plausible that other forms of life could be based on silicon or some other element. 
In the 90s, NASA acknowledged some of the problems with the Viking program's aims and came up with the following working definition of life, which states that life is a self-sustained chemical system capable of undergoing Darwinian evolution. Dropping the carbon seems like a good idea and adding in evolution also seems like a good move because it's a common feature seen in all life on Earth. But this definition too has problems. For one, Darwinian evolution requires reproduction and reproduction isn't as universal as you might think on Earth. For instance, me as a single individual can't reproduce. You need two people to make babies, not one. And reproduction is required for Darwinian evolution. And add on top of that, there are a bunch of animals like mules that physically can't reproduce, but they still look pretty alive. So any definitions that base themselves in a Darwinian framework will come into this problem that not all living things can actually reproduce. Well, what if we go back to the NASA definition and just knock out this Darwinian evolution condition? Which leaves, life is a self-sustained chemical system. Well, that doesn't work perfectly either because if I take this candle here, it is also a perfectly self-sustaining system. It takes in the wax from the bottom and maintains the flame. And on top of that, things like the water cycle are also self-sustaining. This cycle of evaporation, forming clouds and precipitation, maintaining the oceans has been going on for millions of years. Now you could argue that neither of these things are perfectly self-sustaining because the water cycle has to take in energy from the sun and this candle has to take in oxygen from the environment. But then I'm not self-sustaining either because I have to take in food from my environment to maintain myself. Physicists have taken a different approach stemming from Erwin Schrodinger's book, What is Life? In the book, he more or less defines life as a system that absorbs order from its environment and ejects disorder into it. Now, for a biologist, this definition is a little confusing, but it stems from the second law of thermodynamics, which states that all closed systems will tend to disorder. At first glance, life seems to be an exception to that rule. I mean, I'm holding together just fine as a complex ordered system, and I'm not tending to disorder. But if you look more closely, you can see that as a living thing, I actually turn a lot of order into disorder. For one, the lunch that I had today is now being expelled as carbon dioxide gas as it gets digested and I'm constantly radiating heat out of my skin. Both of those things are really disordered. So we can actually see that life is very good at turning order into disorder in perfect accordance with the second law of thermodynamics. For a physicist, this is what life tends to look like. A system that takes in order from its environment while ejecting disorder into it. Life can then straddle the middle of this process and maintain local complexity. Now, I'm no physicist, so if you want a better explanation of this picture of life, go watch this video on It's Okay To Be Smart with Brian Cox. But even this definition has problems because plenty of other things seem to maintain local order by taking in energy from their environments, like crystals, for example. These guys, just like life, are highly ordered and eject disorder into their environments via complex chemical reactions. So are crystals alive? Well, maybe, but our common sense intuition of life seems to show a pretty big difference between a crystal and a praying mantis, for instance. This is getting pretty frustrating, and I could go on and on about all sorts of different definitions of life. For instance, there's the biochemist definition, which looks at the coupled cycling of organic molecules in aqueous solutions and things that computer scientists use to define life, like a computational algorithmic rendering of Darwinian evolution or something like a system capable of self-production and self-maintenance. Then there's looking at life in terms of the distinction between organism and environment separated by a boundary, or just a bunch of checklists. There's exceptions to all of these definitions, and that actually poses a problem, because if we go to another planet and look for life and it satisfies one definition but not another, did we really find life? I mean, that's exactly what happened with the Viking missions. We went to Mars, got some ambiguous results, and people are still arguing today whether it was really life or not. This is why some people have called Viking and other life detection experiments philosophical errors, because no matter what definition we use, no results are going to satisfy all of these definitions. Heck, not even all life on Earth satisfies all of these definitions. Philosopher Carol Cleland argues that this whole expedition to define life is quite frankly stupid and we shouldn't try to do it. And besides the problems that I've just mentioned, she uses an example from the history of science where scientists attempted to define something completely in vain. In the 15th century, alchemists were puzzled by the nature of water. Seems like a strange problem to us now, but without the tools of modern chemistry, this was actually pretty puzzling. Without atoms or molecules, alchemists could only describe the tangible properties that water seemed to have. So water was more or less defined as a wet, transparent, tasteless, 
odorless liquid that was good at dissolving things. If you've ever done high school biology, you've probably seen a similar kind of checklist for all the properties of life, motion, metabolism, reproduction, growth, and so on. Unfortunately, this checklist for water didn't always work, just as our checklist for life doesn't always work. For instance, muddy water clearly isn't transparent, so does that make it not water? And salty water isn't tasteless, so is that not water either? Plus, alchemists often categorise things that we would now call acids also as water. Even da Vinci had a lifelong interest in the nature of water, saying, water is sometimes sharp and sometimes strong, sometimes acid and sometimes bitter, sometimes sweet and sometimes thick or thin, sometimes health-giving and sometimes poisonous. Swap out some of those words, and da Vinci's search for the nature of water is eerily close to our search for the nature of life. So, what can we learn from this historical case study? Well, of course, eventually water was discovered to be no more than H2O. But this discovery only came with the advent of a fully developed theory of chemistry with elements and periodic tables. More importantly, the flailing attempts to work out exactly what properties water had were ultimately futile. Seeing that history is repeating itself, we should therefore stop trying to define life and start looking for a universal theory of life. Okay, that sounds pretty cool, but how exactly do we do that? And this is where the controversies begin, because there's no consensus on how to move past defining life and onto something more. Cleland herself argues that we need more examples of life if we want to have any hope of developing a full theory. She argues that since all the life that we know of, plants, fungi, birds, bacteria, humans, everything, came from a single universal ancestor, we only have one origin story, and therefore only one data point for constructing a universal theory. And it is pretty hard to draw a trend line based off a single data point. So Cleland suggests that we should search for life as we don't know it. We should go to other planets with only a tentative criteria about what life could be. Don't restrict ourselves down to the carbon chemistry like NASA did with the Viking probes, and be super open-minded as to what strange forms of life could be out there. That way, we can add more data points to our graph and be in a better position to develop a universal theory. Not everyone agrees with this strategy though, since we might have to wait a while before we find life on Mars or on Jupiter's moons or anywhere else in the universe. What should we be doing in the meantime? Just complaining about how we only have one data point? And even if we did have more data points, there's no guarantee that a universal theory is just going to pop out. For comparison, we have plenty of examples of biological species to talk about and are still very far from a universal definition. It's just as mangled as the attempt to define life. And what's more, who's to say that all of life is a single data point anyway? There's already such incredible diversity to theorise about. Why do we need any more? Here are a few of my own thoughts for moving forward. First, we should really emphasise that life doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's very easy to lift things like bacteria or people out of their environments and ask if they're alive as if life is some innate property that they have. But of course, these things are only alive as they're interacting with their environments. We're only alive as we're eating food, drinking water, breathing in air, and so on. As soon as we stop doing all of that, as soon as we stop interacting with our environments, well, we die. Second, life is a process, a verb, not a noun. Again, there's a huge tendency to look at a physical collection of stuff like a virus or a protein inside a cell and ask, hey, is this thing alive? Well, it depends. Are you talking about a virus as it's sitting on a table or as it's actively replicating inside your cells? Those are two pretty different entities precisely because one is involved in a lot of processes whilst the other is not. The more processes that an entity is involved in, the more it seems to be alive. Take a look at all the criteria for life that we've mentioned in this video. They're just about all processes. The actual substances involved in the question of life are therefore secondary. And questions like, are viruses alive, are flawed because they view life as being made of substance, not process. Third, we should be open-minded to the fact that life might not even exist at all. Well, in the sense that life is some well-defined category. And to see why, we can take another look at the history of science, but this time way back to Aristotle in 350 BC. Without going into too much detail, Aristotle came up with a robust theory of physics that more or less worked like this. Aristotle's cosmos was one driven by purpose. Every object had an intrinsic goal, known as a telos, to do a particular thing. The universe was also sharply divided into two realms, the terrestrial and the celestial, separated by the orbit of the moon. 
In the terrestrial realm, the heavy elements of water and earth strive to move downwards, whilst the lighter elements of fire and air strive to move upwards. This actually made a lot of sense. Just look at how flames tend upward, air bubbles rise through water, and how every time you drop a heavy object, it falls. Aristotle then explained sideways or unnatural motion as a corruption of the object's natural purpose-driven motion. The celestial realm, on the other hand, had no such corruption, and there was only one kind of movement, perfect circles. This could easily be observed by the motion of the stars, the sun, and the moon all around the Earth. The planets, though, were a little trickier, but their motion could also be accounted for by layering spheres within spheres. A little complex. But the main thing for us is that together, this gave two distinct systems of physics for the cosmos. One for the heavens, and one for the motions here on Earth. Aristotle's system was actually remarkably good, despite what we might think today, and it lasted for an astonishing 2,000 years until the scientific revolution. It only began to unravel in the 16th century with the rise of heliocentrism, among other factors. This was the idea that we went around the sun, not the other way around, as Aristotle proposed. Though the final nail in the coffin for the distinction between the two realms of physics was Newton's universal law of gravity. Newton's laws of physics gave an explanation for motion throughout the entire cosmos. So there was no longer any need to hold onto two separate systems. The heavens and the earth could now operate under a single one. How does any of this relate back to biology? Well, perhaps we're making the same mistake as Aristotle by separating the world into two realms, the living and the dead. It certainly makes sense to do that, but it also made common sense to split physics into terrestrial and celestial realms. So maybe what we need to develop a universal theory of biology is not examples of aliens, but simply a change in perspective of how to organise the universe. Perhaps the Newton or Newtons of biology are alive today, simply waiting to collapse a boundary between two realms that doesn't actually exist. Thanks for watching Subanima. As always, there's a link to all the references in the description below. I'll see you in the next one.